This month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Allison Cook, Lindsay Trebet, and Super Inframan. If you'd like to help support the show, you can do so at wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? I wasn't originally planning on airing the show tonight the way I'm going to air it. Um, as some of you know, if you follow me on Facebook and such, um, I got flooded again last weekend. Another really weird storm. I talked about some of the weird storms on uh, the Patreon and some of the other weird stuff that hap- has happened recently. Uh, but this storm, like the, the previous one a few weeks ago, kept sort of propagating just short of my house. So just every time we were about to go out of the red and into like the green, where there'd be less rain, the green would turn red. And uh, it dumped a, a ton, absolute ton of water on us and completely flooded my basement. Um, yeah, there's a much longer story there. Go to the, uh, go to my Facebook, Sarai Azkath. I'm very easy to find. All the posts are public. And you can check out what happened, including a time lapse of the basement flooding, which is fun. Um, I want to thank the Where Did the Road Go listeners. So many of you donated. Um, it's actually covered the cost of my water heater. So that's, that is something. I have hot water again, and that is because of you. So thank you very much. Um, if anyone else wants to help out, you can find the info on my page. Again, Soraya Azkath on Facebook. I'm the only one, so you shouldn't be finding any other Soraya Azkath. And you can see all the damage and everything that happened. And, uh, yeah, fun. I, I don't know why, why the storm gods are mad at me, but they, they seem to be targeting my house. Anyway. Uh, so this interview was originally going to be put as a midweek interview. So it's actually, oh, I don't know, over two hours long, maybe two and a half hours long. So I recorded this show a few weeks back with Shirley Black and David Metcalf. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to air part one tonight because I didn't have time this week with all the cleanup and repairs and everything else. I didn't have time to... Uh, to record a new show. So this has never aired before. It is a new show. It was just meant to be one continuous show, but I found a very natural break in it. So it's going to be a two-part show. Tonight will be part one. Part two will either be put up on the site midweek, or I will run it as part two next week. I haven't decided which yet. If you're a Patreon, you're getting the whole thing all at once, not broken in two. So yeah, that's that's the whole of everything that's happened in the last week. Well, not really. Again, there's a lot of details on the Facebook page if you care. And if you want to help out, there's links there too. Either way, please enjoy this conversation, this rather deep conversation with Shirley and David. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have with me Shirley Black. Hi there. And David Metcalf, who we haven't had on the show since maybe the second year in, I think. Yeah, it's so, been a long time. Yeah, about five years ago or so. Maybe more. I don't even know for sure. It was probably 2012, 2013. Well, I started in 2013. Maybe. So maybe 2014. Yeah, it, yeah. Was a, it was a long time ago. And uh, you two, uh, Shirley asked me to put this together because you two had started a conversation um, on Conspiranormal's uh, Zoom meeting thing, but kind of got drowned out of the of what you wanted to talk about. So I'm bringing you two together here so you can actually have that conversation. Yeah, we appreciate it. It's a great opportunity. And also looking up when you were on. Um, way, way back. I can't find it. <laughs> there we are. There we are. David David Metcalf, August twenty fourth, twenty thirteen. Yeah. So you were on in the first year. We talked about remote viewing and, and Russell Targ. 
And we talked. We also yeah. talked about music. Uh, yeah. Because you were doing an experiment with music, where you were tr- listening to different styles of music, and only those styles, and then switching styles of music. Yeah. The. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was uh, radio experiments with uh, brainwashing. Yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> the so, yeah, meeting people, and, yeah. People can still hear that, so they can. It's, it's up on the website and the YouTube. But anyway, that's not what we're going to talk about tonight. What are we going to talk about tonight? I believe we're going to, well, we will uh, not necessarily remote viewing, but I think we were going to talk about... Um, some of the dis- different aspects of the the parapsychology culture. Okay, is that is that accurate, Shirley? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. That that don't that don't necessarily get covered. Um, kind of a, a Jacques Vallée uh, cultural sort of look at at the parapsychology scene. All right. So who who wants to start? Well, Shirley, did you want to, the, the whole conversation kind of started out with you describing an experience that you had recently. Did you want to kind of touch on that a little bit? Sure, sure. Yeah, um, you know, because I was kind of asking David a little bit about the backstory of some of the parapsychologists, because, you know, other than their scientific credentials, which are, which are important, <laughs> um, but sometimes there's other things there's like a backstory going on that and until you find out about that you don't really understand what's going on um with parapsychology and it was it was the story that it actually goes back a number of years my part of the story that i didn't have any context for at the time but i had been uh you know corresponding and skyping with a, a physicist, a really nice man. You know, I will not say anything bad about him. He's a nice person, but I think he might have been taken in by people who weren't so nice. Mm. And at the time, he uh, he had contacted me um, and was interested in, in the, the psychokinesis type experiments I'd been taking part in. And, and so, you know, and it was originally, that was the first focus of our, our conversations. And we talked a lot on Skype. Um, and, uh, and, and he had asked for kind of some odd things. <laughs> and one of the things he'd asked me for were my handprints. Huh. And, and, you know, and now he was asking for them because they were supposed to go to this psychic, apparently a very expensive psychic who has a great reputation. I don't really know the the psychic, but that they were going to read my handprints to find out just who I was. And I kind of thought, well, I know who I am. Like, I don't really need that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, and quite honestly, I felt a little bit strange about anything that involved um, giving someone a copy of my fingerprints. (laughs) Yeah. That's That's reasonable. Yeah. You know, like that was... That was kind of how the, it just seemed a very odd thing at the time. And then the other thing was this, this person was promoting a, a, a school in Russia that teaches psychokinesis, or at least reportedly teaches psychokinesis. And he had gone there and said it was just the most wonderful thing. And he had learned so much. And I was open to trying techniques like, you know, if you wanted to explain to me how to do it, I was quite happy to try them out and see how they worked. But I didn't want to go to Russia <laughs> to learn. Right. And, and he really pushed that whole idea about going to Russia and going to Russia. And I was like, no, and it's too expensive. And then it was like, well, you know, we, we can find funding to send you there. And I was like, no, no, no. And, and it, you know, I kept turning down the opportunities for it and, after a while, we kind of lost contact over other issues, but, you know, I hadn't heard from him for a number of years, and then I'd heard from him again in the past year or so, um, because he and another scientist were doing some new psychokinesis experiments, and I guess they had brought a number of other psychics to their laboratory to work on things, and I didn't really want to go there 
I said that I would be happy to do distance experiments because actually I think that's way more fun and and much like it's just better because mm-hmm. if because if you're there on site and something moves and and they can't explain it they can look at you and say oh you must have cheated right if you do it over Skype and something moves um they can't say you cheated and in this case with this scientist it came down to everything was an electrical malfunction on his end <laughs> i think you've seen you've seen that one video right yep. right sir yeah. it was the electrical malfunction where everything's moving like crazy <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah you're, you're, you're the electrical malfunction surely yeah and of course and, and 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 you know and i set it up that way on purpose because i looked at the setup he was using and i thought okay this is really susceptible to, to all sorts of things if I were in the room with that setup. Uh, and so the way it was done over Skype is nobody was in the room with the setup. It was the camera was turned on and and he left the room and then I would try the experiment. And of course I was in another country. And and to me that was a, a better experiment. But again, every time something happened, you know, I mean, I think on one one time he was saying, "Oh, it was really sem- te- or sensitive to temperature," and he blamed the sun going down because <laughs> the temperature <laughs> of the house changed. And so, and of course, my feeling was, "Okay, well, if if if, if we're gonna start blaming the sun going down, <laughs> then <laughs> then it's not a very good experimental setup." Yeah, you know, like it got that way. So anyway, I never went there, but. I, around the time that they brought other psychics there, they started bringing up the whole let's go to Russia thing again. And again, I opted out and I said, no, I don't want to go. And I don't care if anyone's paying my way. I'm not going. <laughs> um, and didn't really think anything more of it. And actually, after after that, that one video I sent a you where everything's moving and he blamed it on electrical malfunctioning, never heard from him again. <laughs> hmm. Which is really co- actually quite common, I find. Um, that it seems like whenever you get really good results or interesting looking results, like even if you look at it and go, okay, well, it's electrical malfunction, we need a better setup. Generally, that's not where most scientists would quit experimenting, you right. know, when something anomalous looking happens. Um, they just would make a better setup and try it again. But that's kind of where it stopped, and that's often really common with parapsychology is you get something interesting, and then they just stop looking anymore. So anyway, I hadn't really thought about this for a while because they stopped contacting me, and I wasn't going to chase anyone. And then I heard a Coast to Coast episode with Nancy de Tetra, where she went, she talked about going on this trip to Russia. Mm. Well, and, and we should probably uh, uh, explain who Nancy is, too. Um, Soraya, do you know, do you know who I do Nancy not. is? So she was actually a student of Ingo Swann's. Oh. Um, she visited him, um, at his apartment and it was later in his life. Um, so he kind of, uh, I guess trained her in a way. Um, he, that she has a funny backstory where he didn't, he didn't trust her at first. Uh, I guess she showed up. I don't, and I don't, I don't, Nancy, or, uh, Shirley, you may know that this, uh, anecdote better than I do, but, um, as I remember it, she showed up to his place to meet him and he thought that she was, uh, <laughs> she was an intelligence agent. And he said, you know, like, oh, okay, they're, you know, now they're trying a woman on me or something like that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, that she was there to kind of, uh, you know, seduce him and get his, his secrets or something. But uh, he realized that wasn't the case. So she spent just a lot of time with him and, uh, and, and learned from him and that. So, so that's who Nancy is. So, okay. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, and and Nancy was one of the psychics that had gone to this laboratory to to do some of these experiments, and she actually said that they blamed the sun going down on one of the ones she was there at too. <laughs> like she said, all all of the kind of things that they were saying were not working when I was doing it distance wise. Were not working when they were there in person doing it a month earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, and, and uh, not only that, but one of the 
um, one of the people who went there to, to do the experiments, they totally crushed this poor man. I mean, he, he had been getting these great results, moving like a pinwheel in a jar at home, and then he goes there, and they tell him, nope, everything is due to temperature. It's just your, the heat of your body is affecting our equipment, and it, it's not nothing. There's no real effect there whatsoever. And, and, and apparently they were, it was quite harshly done, and the poor fellow was crushed. And, of course, I'm thinking, yeah, well, gee, it's a good thing I didn't go there in person because they would have just said that. Like, you know, if, if I had been in the room when the electrical malfunctions were taking place, um, you know, then then they would have either blamed me for being too warm or or <laughs> cheating or you know or something. So but, you know, what, what do you think they were trying to prove that this stuff doesn't exist? I don't know. I don't know. Well, it seems. It seems. I think there's a little bit of like fear of psi going on there. Because hmm. because I kind of said that to Nancy. I said, were they trying to were they trying to debunk us all? Um, were they, you know, like, was the purpose of this to crush everybody and to debunk this? And she said she didn't really think that was the case. I said, because I said, like, I don't really know them well enough. Like, I wasn't there in person like you were. And she says that she she really wasn't sure. Hmm. That, you know, um, that, that she seemed to think that they were honestly trying to look for Psy and, and, get these great experiments like he was talking about getting a nobel prize for this work and i was looking at the setup <laughs> going you know and i was looking at the setup going no 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 because i mean i've worked with a few scientists who i think if their work pans out th that they might be of that caliber but this work wasn't <laughs> like not in any way i mean it just wasn't <laughs> and and uh you know, it, it seemed kind of odd, like why, what, you know, why was even kind of bringing that Nobel Prize thing up? Like that seemed ridiculous. Yeah. You know, and I mean, and I thought it was a joke because I laughed, but apparently Nancy told me I shouldn't have because it was serious. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't make it not funny. <laughs> yeah, it I makes know. It, it makes it a little funnier, I guess. You know, yeah. That, like that was, I, That's sad. Yeah. You know, so I don't know whether it was just they really thought they had something and then you know like sometimes scientists work like parapsychologists will often just sabotage themselves when they start to get good results it's like on some level they don't want them hmm. you know and, and i mean i've seen that kind of over and over again so yeah, it, can, um with the the esp trainer app that um russell targ has put out um you can actually experiment with that where um, the more you doubt it, like you'll start to get psi missing, right? Like you'll get like really good results. And then if you doubt it, or if you're too excited about it, it will start to taper off. At least when I've used it, I've had that experience where I can actually feel the like, the psi missing start to occur. Yeah. What, what, what app is this? Uh, it's called ESP. Uh, I think it's just called ESP Trainer. It's a uh, it's an hmm. iPhone app that is the um, Russell Targ developed an ESP Trainer for NASA, um, and it's the the iPhone app version of it. So there's, an just, an, there's an Android too. Oh, cool. Okay, there wasn't for a while. So oh, is there? Say. Yeah, that's that's new. <laughs> yeah, that that's they they must have put that out in the last year or last couple of years because it it had been iPhone only for a while. But it's a fun, it's a fun little device. Yeah. yeah. The Winbridge Institute also has some um, some apps available for psi training. Mark Bacuzzi has been developing um, different psi games as a way to kind of test the different ways that people might be able to develop and train their psi. Because not everybody is the same in what they respond to. Right. So... <laughs> yeah, it's it's weird. I mean, and it doesn't, um, you know, I I think about this quite often because of the amount of of research that there is out there. You know, um, especially available online, and um, 
I think one of the interesting examples of, of what's possible is um, there's a group called the Randonauts who developed a uh, kind of geocaching for synchronicities. Mm-hmm. So it will generate a point um, based on a rag uh, event generator, and you go to that point with an intention and then quite often they found that the intention matches the point that's generated randomly, right? Yeah. Um, or something weird will happen at this point where like it'll tell you to go to this point and there's some odd uh, sign there or whatever, you know, and then of course part of that is sort of building the narrative and creating the narrative uh, in your own mind and, and that kind of thing. But there's been some really weird coincidences that occur with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, this kind of stuff was available, and it was always out there. You could always do it, but for some reason, it took literally, like, just two guys that were kind of messing around to develop this app and to launch it and to do it. And their intention, like, they're now backtracking on the parapsychology and backtracking on the the research into synchronicity and that and intention and that kind of thing. Um, And then start from that they started from kind of like a let's hack the matrix idea um Mm. you know but there's no scientists looking at them and they're like they're constantly like they're churning out like tons of of data and tons of examples and you know it's tracked because it's an app so uh, it's all out there but nobody nobody's looking at that kind of thing you know or uh, i mean cheryl lee you've been uh to a bunch of different labs with a bunch of different scientists and that, you know, and there's always kind of this sense of like defeat. I think I, I kind of get the sense a lot. Um, yeah. 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 It, it's like, it's I'll go and we'll get great establishment and that kind of thing. Yeah. It's like, you'll get great results and then, and then you won't hear from them. And then you'll hear them on a radio show saying, oh, you know, we would sure like to have this person back, but they never ask you back. And then a few months later, it'll be, gosh, we're really looking for somebody who's good at any of these things. If anyone knows anyone like that, could you let us know? (laughs) Yeah. You know, and that's how, I mean, it just, it goes through that. Well, you know, even even Jane Roberts said that, you know, she had numerous authors for uh, Seth to be tested for this stuff, and they never heard back from anyone they, they did the tests with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's strange. And I think a lot of it, you know, a lot of it's done, you know, with limited funding and that kind of thing. But um, that's not always an excuse either because there was one situation where I was given an opportunity and it was like a parapsychologist who kind of sent these people my way. It was a Japanese film crew. And they wanted to have me in a laboratory and they were willing to pay all the costs. And they had a fairly significant budget. And not one laboratory, that, and including none of the ones I've worked in before, um, were willing to do it. The only one who was willing to do it was somebody that I, I was not comfortable with. <laughs> mm. because, because they have some poor practices in terms of, you know, poor scientific practices. And I, what, and, and I knew that that individual would have been using me to get publicity <laughs> and yeah. and it and it wasn't for me to it wasn't to actually do a good scientific study at all so but all of these laboratories that have told me time and time again oh we just don't have the money um they all they all turned down that money and said no we don't want to do that <laughs> 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 well, and I think there's, you know, there's a fear too of too much publicity, but not enough publicity. It's a really weird kind of, you know, and that's one of the, the things that in, in looking at the stuff and talking about it, I think the human factor is often left out, you know, in the, the cultural factors. Um, in, in just in terms of, you know, people don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to be, they don't want to be hoaxed. And so even if they have Mm. good results, they start doubting that, you know, and there's been such a concerted effort to make it all look stupid that, um, you know, even if you get the, you know, and I, I saw it with, um, (laughs) with my own brother, he, uh, he produces a show for, uh, Georgia state university. And, um, I, 
got him uh, in contact with uh, the folks at the University of West Georgia. And, you know, I thought that I could trust that he would go in and do neutral, maybe leaning towards positive. But he had his own ideas of what was going on there. And he produced a show that they were unhappy with. Mm. And it was weird to me because I was like, this wasn't hard, man. Like, you could have just, you know, you could have just shot it straight. But he sculpted a narrative that he wanted to sculpt onto it. And it wasn't an it wasn't a negative narrative, but it was a very supernaturalist narrative. And the University of West Georgia folks were like, "What is this? Like, this isn't what we said. You know, this isn't what was going on here." So, and it had to do with their psychomantium uh, work, you know. And then he told me he was like, "It's just a sheet with a mirror. It looks stupid. I can't show that on film." <laughs> and I was like, "Well." <laughs> that's that's what they're doing like that's what the test is like that's the you know the 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 psychomantium room is not a complex device so that's yeah. what they got you know like this is that's not what this isn't some i think he thought he was going to go into some kind of like minority report style lab or something you know when in reality that's not what it was so yeah and i know for some of the tv shows um they want to. They want bells and whistles in the laboratories, and they want to make things look more futuristic or whatever. Yeah. So I know yeah. one of the one researcher who actually said that he would be interested in it. They turned him down because his lab didn't look flashy enough. Because <laughs> it was really boring equipment. <laughs> wow. But on the bright side, because. I found out who he was through the emails. I started corresponding with him and he actually brought me into his lab to do stuff. <laughs> so I got to work with him and not have to deal with the stupid camera, crew, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> which was better, which is actually a lot better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you think of like the, you know, like the ghost hunting shows and that, like they ham it up and they've got the wrong oh, yeah. equipment and they've got all that. And it's very, it's goofy, you know, it's real goofy. <laughs> and yeah. Oh, and yeah. Well, or, or like the Skinwalker Ranch show, which I just, oh my God. Yeah. It's, yeah. So, it's so stupid. Like, cause they'll point out things I'm, I'm looking like the first two episodes, I'm looking at stuff going, okay, has someone with an education in geology, I can explain everything they're showing. And, right. and, and they don't really say, oh, and here's some possible explanations. They just go on to the next thing and I'll go, oh gosh, gee, the gamma radiation is, is increasing as you go upwards. And I'm going, well, it should. It's the atmosphere. We're going up towards the Van Allen belts. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, they, they, that's Bruce, how it works. <laughs> Bruce McAbee pointed that out. They did a, I guess they did like a, um, it was one of their promo shots of a telephone pole moving. And he was like, there's no way that the telephone pole, based on its length and everything, could move like that. And he goes, I think they were just moving the camera. And then when it got to the actual episode and they showed it, they were shaking the camera to make an effect. You yeah. know? And it was like, yeah. why? You know, I don't know. And it's, it's strange to me because I've been on a big, like, watching 1940s movies kick, you know? Mm -hmm. And you can, you can develop a narrative without all the goofy, you know? Like, you can have, the, you can have all of it without all of the the craziness and that's one of the things that actually really interests me about um psychical research is that so much of it really is mundane you know and it's it's this fascinating mystery that exists in the everyday you know it's not um yeah it's not some crazy high-tech like thing it's it's in us you know and it's in our it's in our interactions and in our interactions with the environment not just some kind of weird, you know, techno future thing. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what do you think the biggest uh, biggest problems with trying to measure this stuff in the labs are? It's actually not that hard to measure the stuff in the lab. The hard part is to just not be distracted away from what you get. Like, you know, I, I mean, there, there's a certain amount of when you get good results, you'll freak out and not do well for a while. I, mm. You know, like when I did, I did a number of kind of at home experiments where, and I did it for about a year, like every night for about a year, I started off, I would take a PANA smooth score. And that stands for positive and negative effect score. 
and it's it's like a, a standard psychological test used to quantify mood. Okay. And it's it's used like you know in in psychological type sciences, and it, it's you know it, it's it's copyright free, so it's great for anyone who wants to to do these kind of things. Because I was like trying to figure out like how do you quantify mood? Because I wanted to see if mood had an effect on whether or not I could get the little wheel to move, right? Yeah. And so anyway, so every night I would do my do the mood test, and then I'd see how long it took me to get the wheel to spin. And I did that every night for about a year. And what I found was that initially I was getting phenomenally good results. Like just that wheel was just spinning right away. And then it started to freak me out a bit and it just dropped to nothing. Like I had this really dry period (laughs) where it just would not work. And I thought, I've cured myself. Oh my God, I've cured myself. This isn't going to happen anymore. And, you know, and I kept doing it just because it's like, yeah, I'm not going to give up because I'm cured now, but I'll just keep being cured. We'll just keep doing this. And then what happened is it started to work again over time really slowly. And it took quite a while. And then it just got back up to the levels it was when I, my first kind of beginner luck stuff. (laughs) And, and I, and that, you know, and I've heard about that kind of a, of a of a pattern where you sort of have your beginner luck then it just drops off so that you suck totally and then you have to keep working at it over pe- period of time before you kind of build back up to where where you started and then you can kind of stay there once you've kind of worked at it and i've heard that from remote viewers and and a lot of different areas of psi phenomena so you kind of if if you if that's how it works um, it's really easy to, to get someone going to lab and get a few really great results and then drop off and then it stays dropped off for a while. And it's like, well, see, statistically, they couldn't do it. <laughs> it was just a mm. fluky thing that happened at, at the beginning. And you really have to be stubborn and do it over a long period of time before you really see that increase back up to the original levels again. And that's oh. some, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, that's one. Uh, George Hansen has actually pointed that out in terms of um, some of the organizations that have claimed to train Psy, um, and he he pointed out Scientology, which has at like the OT level they've got psychic training, and um, the AMORC, which is that Rosicrucian organization out of San Jose, um, which uh, used to be. They used to have ads and everything from the Farmer's Almanac to the UFO magazines to, um, you know, all, and everything in between. Um, but they train for, uh, you know, psychic skills and that. Um, some of the old New Thought stuff, like William Walker Atkinson uh, had books on psychic training and that. Um, but it, it was thought of... As you know, it, Russell Targ's kind of popularized this idea of like yoga, you know, like a yoga almost to uh, to train it. But it, it has that that element of having to stick with it over time. You know, it's not something that you just you do and then suddenly it's wonderful. Like it's something that you got to practice, like learning a, learning an instrument or a sport or martial arts or any of that. You know, like there's that that peak at the beginning and then it dips down and you've got to train through that, that kind of dip. But with something that, you know, society to some extent says doesn't exist, that's kind of harder to, to push through that, that dip, you know? And then when you do a lab thing, you know, if the lab experiment isn't going to go for five years, you know, if it's only going to go for a month or two months or something, then unless you have somebody who's already gone through that dip, it's not going to, and a lot of this, you know, starting with Ryan and that, they were testing regular people. You know, it wasn't a matter, I think it, to some, there were some, there's examples like Eileen Garrett and that, where they had people that were, were high, high functioning psychics. But, um, you know, there was this whole period of time where they just wanted to touch the general population. And it wasn't until the SRI stuff where they were like, you know, where it became, weaponized to some extent where they needed people that could actually perform and do it regularly where they started targeting people for training that were you know um keyed into actually performing at that level 
and then stuck with it and kept the people going, you know. But they, even there, they looked, they all, they took advantage of the whole beginner's luck thing. Because if they had a skeptic come into the lab, they would get them to just try it. Yeah. Yeah. At, you know, you know, figuring that, okay, they're going to get this great result the first time. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of stories about they when they were trying to sell the program, they would have the people come in and then, and do the remote viewing. Hmm. But yeah. to, yeah, and to truly, you know, to truly, to truly do it, you've got to, you got to stick with it and and experience it. And you know, like like you said, Shirley, when you started doing it, it's kind of freaky, you know. And it's so you start to ask questions about what does this mean, you know. And the more, depending on the level of the phenomena that you're experiencing, you know, it can get kind of weird. <laughs> you can start to yes. have some like reality starts to kind of get a little bit wavy, you know. So, yeah. And I think that happens to a lot of the scientists because it's one thing if you're an experiencer and you're going in a lab and you've already kind of dealt with the fact that weird things happen. It's quite another yeah. thing for the scientists because what happens is that if if they're doing anything that's useful, they're going to find out that they're influencing it too. Like yeah. It, yeah. You, you can't really separate yourself. You can't be the scientist and not be affecting what's going on in the lab. And when you find that out, well, it really messes you up as a scientist because it's even though, you know, like, was it Rosenthal figured out that, that scientists had an effect on their work back in the 60s? That's not something that they bring up when you get a, a you know, a science degree nowadays. Right. You know, you know like that, that whole experimenter effect thing is kind of ignored, even though it's, it's a part of the mainstream literature. And it's uh, funny too. I was actually talking to somebody uh, who was talking about epidemiology in that sense, where they found that, you know, when you're, uh, when you're working on a vaccine or something, um, you have to go through quite a bit to get over that um, experimenter effect, even with, you know, biochemistry. Where they found that you can do the you can do the thing exactly right, and you still get a failed result. But if you keep doing it and you kind of get into that mode and you get into the the lab and you get the feel for it, you do the same steps and the same amount and everything, and it works. You know, so it's it's across the sciences where you have this experimenter effect, and it's kind of anecdotal when you're a professional in it. But like you said, Shirley, it's not actually taught. It's not something that like, unless you have a really good, you know, teacher or something, it's not something that's handed to you when you're, when you're getting the degree, you know? And, and it should be because it's published literature. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, you know like, was it Robert Rosenthal, 63, something like that? <laughs> just off the top of my head, I could have the year wrong because I'm not that good at that. But I believe that was roughly when that, you know, when those early experiments were done on that. Um, but, but yeah, so, you know, that's part of it. Part of why I think kind of makes scientists back off because they have to kind of deal with that. But what what is the implication of that? I mean, it suggests that we're all just constantly modifying our own reality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> that's exactly the yeah. that's exactly what it is. I mean, you think about like the um the book synchronicities that uh or the book angel phenomena that Colin Wilson and Jacques Vallée have talked about, right? Um in I've done like a long term experiment with that where for a long time, um until recently I didn't buy books outside of a resale shop, but I would get really rare, weird books that I needed for my research. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, I mean, and I'm talking like rare, small press should never have been at like a, a local Georgia uh, resale shop would appear when I needed them, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, and, and I got to the point where I, I literally just, I wouldn't buy books on Amazon or anything. I would just wait for the books that I needed to show up. And so, you know, when you can do stuff like that and kind of live in it and experience it, you know, um, it gives you a different sense of, of what our reality is, you know. 
Um, and those deeper questions really kind of get, you know, I mean, if you want to live in like a stable, you know, like everything is kind of lockstep and makes sense. That's, that's not where this stuff goes to, you know? <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. it, it makes sense. I think we're just looking at it the wrong way. I mean, we expect everything to apply to essentially everyone. Right. You know, like everything is empirical. If it exists, it exists. It, it, and it seems like we all shift reality around us in, in subtle little ways, even if we're not actively psychic, even if we don't realize we're doing it, it's still happening. Right. And and the people that are, are more in tune to that, able to shift into other people's experience. You know, I had a, um, an interesting thing. I'm going to be on Friday talking to Mark Stavish, who's the director for the Institute of Hermetic Studies. And where I went to high school was a town over from where he was doing um, alchemical experiments with uh, a bunch of uh, alchemists that were trained in the European schools of alchemy, which actually have like lineage back to, you know, at least the, the 1700s, if not farther back. And then it gets into weird mythology stuff and who knows, but at least to the 1700s, they've got practices that have been, that have been passed along. So Mark and this group were a town over doing their experiments and, um, in like late college and then right out of college i was having uh some out-of-body experience stuff that was weird as i was looking at alchemy right and so it turns out that as i was having these experiences and kind of learning from them and uh exploring them through kind of a comparative religion sense um mark was writing a book on what I was experiencing, right? Mm. And then he publishes his book, I read his book, it confirms the experiences that I was having. And it was only later that I was, you know, when I started talking to him years later, I didn't know him at the time, um, that I realized, and it clicked, I was like, oh, you guys were doing your experiments literally a town over, <laughs> you know? And one of the things that we were talking about was kind of the area effect of what he was doing because the purpose that they were doing they were actually building a space they were they were trying to build a an intentional cloud would be a, a kind of colloquial way of saying it like a, a simple way of putting it but an intention cloud around what they were doing and i was within the radius of that you know so take that for what it is i mean i'm not i i, I think one of the things i've learned with any of this stuff is that you know there's the narrative element to it and then there's the experiential element and who knows what's what's true true you know but um i do know that the the things that i was experiencing at the time coincided exactly with what he was writing about in his book and he was literally developing that stuff a town over you know and i didn't know him at the time so right. um it was really interesting years later to talk to him to hear how he got the information that he put into the book and to kind of all those things start to click. And then now it's been, you know, years after that, as we've continued to talk where I've, other things have clicked and, you know, I've started to see more of that, you know, so. Hmm. So if you Is have it? wizard, if you have wizards in your neighborhood and you're attuned to it, you can feel them, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Not just the ones that make bad faces at you. <laughs> yeah, not just, you can feel that too. It's just a different. It's a, a grosser feeling. You know, <laughs> it's not as it's not as enlightening. Huh. So I never did tell you about get to the Russians. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's go yeah. to the Russians. <laughs> no, I was thinking. Gee, we've got we've had this great conversation, and totally forgot what we started with. <laughs> That's okay, which yeah, let's, is great. Let's loop back into the Russians. Okay. So so you explained who Nancy was, and actually you did a better job than I did. I've I've talked to Nancy on the phone, um, but but I don't really know a lot about her her what's public you right. know, for her, for right. her other than I like I like we talked about Ingo Swan because because uh, and and about Michael Persinger because Nancy's been to Michael Persinger's lab too. So we had 
we had discussions about him, which was kind of nice to talk to somebody else who knew him. Mm. Um, but anyway, you know, so I found out, you know, about sort of the early, you know, the on-site experiments that I wasn't part of, um, where you know it was it was the sun going down on the equipment <laughs> or, <Right>. or whatever <laughs> or whatever, and it made me. I mean, I was really glad you know, that I did not go there in person and that all the experiments I did were from a distance. Cause I really think that it, I really think that it would have been very disheartening to go there and have everything blamed on, on equipment malfunctions. And I, and I would have been really afraid that it would have been blamed on me cheating. Mm. You know, that's a, cause, cause that comes up a lot, you know, and that always upsets me because I've heard parapsychologists at least one in particular say that, you know, all psychics cheat, like we're just bad people and that's what we do. And so if something happens and they can't explain it, then you must've cheated. So, right. you know, the sa- safest thing you can do is be in another country during the experiment. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's, that that's, you know, a good plan of action to avoid that kind of thing. So anyway, um, you know, you know, I, I had kind of forgotten about these experiments because they stopped contacting me and I didn't worry about it. And and then I heard Nancy on coast to coast describing a nightmare trip to Russia and, <laughs> and Oh, the poor woman, like she, she went through an absolute horrible experience there. Uh, she wasn't sure if she was going to be allowed to come back to the United States and and the scientist, like the the nice little old man that was trying to con- convince me to go over there originally, and was going to find funding for me to go over there, and he was going to go with me. Well, he he had set everything up, and then dropped out of the trip the week before on her. Oh, yeah. So he wasn't there to to deal with the people over there, and she think thankfully had brought a friend of hers with her so she didn't go alone but they were like locked in a room and not allowed to go to the bathroom without somebody um escorting them they they didn't know when they'd get to eat they weren't sure when it, they'd ever be allowed to leave wow I, yeah like it, welcome it was, to russia <laughs> that's terrible yeah and and she said that it was run by a um a, an ex-soviet military person and that she said it was a cult, <laughs> and that was that was her description of it. That it was it was this creepy, crazy cult, and she she spent like she didn't get the trip paid for her, um, and she spent crazy amounts of money to go on this. And apparently, they kept raising the price as it got closer to the day that they were supposed to be leaving. Oh. You know, and and. Um, like it was just horrible and she got very ill. She had back problems. Thankfully she was able to get things resolved when she got home. But again, what were they doing to her when she was there? You know, it was like sleep deprivation and not feeding her properly. It really sounded like a a crazy cult. Well, that's the, that's the thing with your handprint too. I actually had a guy tell me one time that he knew I was okay because he knew a remote viewer and they had viewed me and so I checked out and you know again whatever's true and not true I don't know but knowing that these things are effective that was really invasive to me and I just stopped talking to the guy you know and because uh, it was like don't do that like that's weird you know and like wanting your handprint like I mean, a lot of the the Russian work is with uh, psionics and radionics and psychotronics and stuff, you know? And so beyond kind of, you know, like fingerprinting and that kind of thing, they imply, you know, within that, that they can do work on people through stuff like a handprint. And that's, you know, if you're in a situation where the people believe that, whether or not they can actually do it, it's really offensive to, you know, to ask for something like that. You know, it'd be like someone who believes they're practicing witchcraft being like, oh, can I have a lock of your hair? You know, like, no, yeah. not, probably not, you know. 
that's that's really invasive and then to hear nancy's experience that sounds terrible like that's yeah 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 like i i am so glad that i never went there and the fact that they like i said it was just it just seemed too good to be true why would anyone find funding for me to go to a foreign country to learn pk <laughs> like no <laughs> No, like that, and and also wanting you know, wanting a, a handprint so that they could find out who I truly was, and was I you know some second coming of who knows what? I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> like Lord Lord knows what, but you know, or you know, am I the devil incarnate? Who knows? Like <laughs> what? Yeah, what, or they're they're putting it on some kind of weird psionic machine and trying to you know destroy your mind or something. Yeah, I don't know. It all gets that's the th- it all gets into like weird areas where I don't know. I wouldn't want to be dealing with a Russian psychic group at all, <laughs> like, just because no. of the the tensions and everything. Like that's that that would be intense. Yeah. Uh, no, like I said, I am just I am so glad that that you know that my gut feeling right from the start was no, I don't. I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly yeah. that's a good feeling. Yeah. But you know, I feel badly for Nancy because her curiosity got the best of her and she went, hmm. <laughs> you know, well, she was able to bring back the report, stay away, you know, stay definitely. Yeah. Confirmed, confirmed the intuition. Do not, do not go to the, the Russian cycle. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. And it, <laughs> You know, and it was just kind of one of those strange synchronicities again that, you know, like I didn't, I didn't know who she was until she participated in, you know, some of the same research. And then she wanted to get a hold of me. Like she, she was actually the one who reached out to me because she wanted to talk on the phone, um, you know, and because she had said that the researchers made me sound like I was some kind of second coming and that I was the big, <laughs> you know, I was the, the one they had all their hopes on. And, and then, you know, looking at what was set up, I thought, well, this, they don't, aren't really acting like this is that, that important, you know, because I guess, you know, like one of the things I've kind of learned is I don't do all the work for setting up research. I make the researchers do it. And if they want to do it, they will do it. And if they don't, they, because often I find that I'll do all the work and they'll take all the credit. For it. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and that'll just annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, that. You know, and that's happened to me a few times. So, so, and the other thing is that, that you, you like, I know that it's not something that, that you can do a one-off experiment and be done. Yeah. That you have to be willing to put in a long term and get a decent amount of data points. And most of them aren't willing for they they want an experience, they don't really want the data. <laughs> Huh. Yeah, it's like the side, like side drug, you know, the like get the the rush of the of the phenomena, and not yeah. the actual science behind it. And I think that's where the cult stuff comes in, you know. With, um, you know, Valet writes about it with the UFO subject and belief and the manipulation of belief through uh, the UFO phenomena. And I think size really similar, where a lot of people come to it. Um, searching for meaning or searching for something else, you know, searching for some kind of of uh, validation from it, you know, yeah. even even scientists, you know. Well, yeah, well, and uh, like you see that with you know the near death experience community, where yeah. they're you know they're preyed upon by cults and and even their scientific organizations get infiltrated by these cults because they want. Well, first off, they're looking for recruits that are open to you know, open to them, and secondly, they're looking for an association with science so that they can say that they're not a cult; they're a scientific organization. They're yeah. a self-help scientific organization. Gee, I wonder what that sounds like. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know um, so. So you really have to, you know, like I really enjoyed going to near death experience conferences 
because I like to meet other experiencers and talk. And it's really cool. You get in the experience room and suddenly it's like everybody understands your language because they've been there too. You know, and it's really exciting when when you when you start going, did you have this experience? Yeah, yeah. And was it like this? And I'm like, oh my God, yes, it was. And <laughs> and you know, you sort of you have that in common. But then there's this kind of darker aspect around it where there's people who are preying on you, trying to say, oh yeah, we understand you totally and want to validate you. You know, <laughs> come be a member of our special group, <laughs> and and they're a cult, right? You know, and 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 they kind of look at the near death experiencers as having special abilities, which I think, you know, you know, like yeah, you hang out with near death experiencers, and it's not uncommon to have electronic malfunctions and elevators going crazy in the building, and you know cell phones going off when they shouldn't and <laughs> like you know like you know it's like the, the more people who've had near death experiences in an enclosed space the the crazier things get around you and i think that's true of like people who report having ufo experiences as well hmm. you know oh like, yeah definitely yeah yeah you know like the the all all of these different anomalous experiences when you get people who've had experiences together in a group it just charges the air somehow yeah and things get things can get very strange <laughs> incredibly strange it's it's pretty amazing yeah <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. You, sorry sorry go ahead oh it's, no go ahead go with what you were going oh, i was gonna i was gonna ask Lee because uh this is something that we had talked about the other day but the uh the pk contagion factor right the, yeah you know yes yeah no like when i was at the rhine and i would like like really the first time i went to the rhine really they just wanted the experience at least most of the people there um you know there was one day where i was kind of i had this you know, the schedule of the day was I was supposed to meet all the scientists at the Rhine and just talk to them about, you know, who I was. And I was going to tell them about my educational background and what I was doing with my life kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they didn't, they weren't interested in that part at all. They just wanted me to spin the little wheel in the jar for them. Even <laughs> though, even though that was supposed to be done like in a controlled lab setting, not just. They just wanted to see it. They just wanted to see it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so I started showing it because clearly that's, that was, they came for the show. They didn't really come to talk to me. And so I, I did that for them. And like, um, you know, like some of them, like, well, like John Cruth has said in interviews that, you know, it was the most amazing thing he ever saw. And when the interview asked him, you know, what did you do afterwards after you saw this thing that was the most amazing thing you'd ever seen? He was like, Oh, I didn't really do much with it. It wasn't really what, what I was studying at the time. <laughs> you know, it was like, yeah, I just forgot about it. Sorry. <laughs> it was it was really exciting for the moments I was doing it, but or, you know, but afterwards they just kind of yeah they ignored it and forgot about it. But but there was this weird thing about contagion where once I showed people, other people like uh, when I showed it to people, they could do it for a while, mm. and it kind of spread and it. And on my final night there, we went out to dinner in a restaurant and we were passing around the jar and everybody was taking turns spinning the wheel inside the jar. <laughs> and um, No, go ahead. Oh, well, and that's something that uh, Raymond Bayless, um, who was a researcher in the 70s and 80s, um, he wrote about that with EVP, where he was trying to do EVP <laughs> experiments and he wasn't getting any results whatsoever, like in no sense, like it was totally nothing. And he went to an EVP experiencer and just sat with them and, you know, they did their thing and they got results and he went home and he started getting EVP results, um, you know, and so it's, it's kind of, it's an interesting phenomenon with, with all of this stuff where, you know, once you're in that environment with somebody who's, who's activated in that suddenly, you know, uh, it can kind of transmit for a while. 
Well, and some of the equipment that I used at the Rhine that I was like an eggly wheel that they had me moving inside a sealed container. Um, apparently, after I left, everyone who came in could get that eggly wheel to spin in that container. And then af- after a while, I, it seemed to just stop working that way. Hmm. So, you know, it was... It, it was activated, but it didn't, it wasn't permanent. Right. Could they have been picking up energy from you? I don't know. Like, you know, either, either there's some kind of residual energy that stuck with what I was working with, or maybe there was psychic, like, you know, I mean, they were very excited about it for a while, but like, has these things work? It's like, people just forget you know it becomes almost like a dream to them after a while Hmm. you know like you have to remind people that they saw it when they saw it right right okay (laughs) you know it's true but it's it's like people remember psi experiences like a dream really kind of yeah Okay, that's that's odd. Yeah, and it's it's a it's actually um, I've had that experience myself, where you know years have passed, I haven't thought about something, and then something will kick in, and I'll be like, oh yeah, that happened, and that was really weird. And there's been a couple of of things where, um, you know, I've known my roommate for uh, seventeen years now, so we've been be places where things have happened, and we've had an experience. And the only way that either one of us can sit with it and be like, yeah, that actually happened and it was really weird is because we were both there, you know, because otherwise it kind of drifts off into the like, yeah, but that doesn't happen every day. And that was extremely weird. And so, you know, it just seems like a, a memory, you know, not a not a thing that could happen again or did happen, you know. Yeah, like I didn't realize how many experiences I was having until I started keeping a journal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, oh, and, yeah. You know, and even now, like you know, I haven't, I mean, I stopped keeping it after a while, but I kept it when I was still corresponding with Michael Persinger. And I mean, I used to share the, the notes with him as to, you know, the time of day and where I was and what happened. And he, he'd look at it in terms of en- environmental effects. Cause that's what he was interested in. But it was just when I started lo- reading those logs over, you know, like if you wait a year and then go back to them, it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, like, because you forget. Right. You know, and then when you read it, it's like, oh, my God, like, like, that happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, how do I forget all these things? <laughs> Well, that's kind of like the, you know, in uh, Alistair Crowley recommended keeping a magic journal, you know, yeah. with when you do when you do work to, to keep a journal of what what you were doing and what the intended effect was. And then you can look back, um, you know, that's the um, I forget his name, but that first that really early book on um, dream premonitions um, totally forget the guy's name but it's a early 20th century book but that's what he did he just started he anecdote you know just kind of in in his habitual life realized that some of the intense dreams that he was having connected later to events that would occur and so he started you know doing these journals and and keeping track of his dreams and seeing you know more and more how those things connected hmm. i'm not familiar with who that would be I can't remember his name. It's, I think that the name of the book has something with time in it or something like that. Um, Cause he was really interested in how the dream content uh, showed a different view of how time flows at least, or at least how we exist in time. It's a famous book and I, I can't remember it for the life of me, the title oh. or the guy, but. Interesting. More recently, uh, Eric Wargo with his Time Loops book has looked yes. at, into that and, uh, and and kind of explored that. He's doing a new book on premonitory dreams, actually, because of that. So, 
Yeah. Well, but his his I I, I think what he said when I had him on is that uh, he thought all dreams were premonitory, and I, I don't agree with that at all. But it's yeah. definitely it's definitely an interesting idea to pursue and see if you can get an idea of how many really are. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Um, that's interesting. I'll have to ask him about that because. Um, Maybe he thinks that they're all in the sense that since it's uh, a kind of bubbling up of these different kind of symbol sets, that um, there's the possibility in all dreams to have content that's influenced like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a, I, we talk a lot about um, his ideas of uh, all psychic phenomena uh, being... Uh, presentiment and i still struggle with that including synchronicity where he ties that in with uh kind of like a retrocausal awareness but so I, you're you're like picking up on the of something you're going to encounter and then you interpret it as a synchronicity right and you know there's but there's been to me synchronicity a lot of times is much weirder than that and yeah. i haven't been able to to really grasp how you know the 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 ultimate level of weirdness that synchronicity can have where it's multiple different people and media and you know something falling at your feet and you know whatever like you encounter in the environment how yeah. that kind those kind of synchronicities which seem much more physical could be related to uh retrocausal uh precognition that doesn't i struggle uh, with yeah that yeah like I said, it's worth looking at, but I mean, it's it's the same with the uh, the idea that what you're experiencing in the near death experience is what, what was it? It was presentiment, or yeah, yeah, presentiment or, or uh, precognitive. Or, yeah, in some the, way, like or like afterwards, you're looking back and remembering something, but you were really dead and you didn't really experience it, right? And it's like, okay, I mean, it's worth looking at, but I, I feel like that's not the answer <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i don't know if that's the way people experience it i mean Shirley, that doesn't does that strike a chord with you because that I, for me the synchronicity explanation being just uh precognition it doesn't work with the way that i experience synchronicities no you know? I, I i don't think it i don't think it answers that at all hmm. The, I mean, it's, it's for for the near death experience. It's like it feels like you're you're walking around the block to come up with another possible explanation. Whereas since it, it, there is another possible explanation with it, it's kind of like okay, well, we can't ignore it. It's good to have other other possibilities since we don't totally know what's happening. But it seems like that one's a little more far fetched. But I've noticed a few people like really clinging on to it, and I feel like it's just that some people just want certain things to be true for whatever reason. Yeah, well, it's it's like I've seen you know, even psychokinesis explained by you know pre precognition. Yeah, the, the, the yeah. idea that that you just happen to know that that was when the book was going to fly off the shelf. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> yeah, and that's what always I never got that. Like, and and supposedly Ed May has a really great explanation for why that's the case, but yeah. it doesn't make sense to me because I've seen. I've seen that level of PK and that what is that's not there's nothing precognitive about that like I've, you're not like I mean that's not I've read his stuff and it could be used for micro right you know, micro PK it does not explain macro PK and I know I've asked him that when you know I've done some of the online seminars and his explanation is that well there's just other there's no such thing as the macro PK, basically. Right. You right. know, the, the, it's, it was an earthquake or something. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't work. That's yeah. that's what I'm taking from that. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I've I've read his stuff over and and it really doesn't make sense if you're going in a macro level. But. Hmm. But his answer is that it doesn't exist at the macro level, that there's not enough evidence for the macro level. So we're just going to ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, then it's a great explanation. 
Well, and this this is the thing. People's beliefs interfere so much with data. Even and and you can you can be a good scientist and still have that happen. It's just like a human thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's kind of the cultural, you know, the the cults drifting in and the um so you know, one of the the more glaring ones is the influence of theosophy on all of this stuff and the way that we talk about a lot of it. Really? Um, yeah, theosophy was a huge influence in it in um just the way a lot of stuff is framed. And it's really interesting to see that that influence just kind of silently drift through. Um, you know, especially now where there's kind of this like new world of psychism sort of thing being talked about. Um, this kind of utopian vision. Uh, I don't, you'd, you'd have to really be digging in the, in the books and that to kind of to notice it. But there's a very like pastel um, consciousness culture kind of healthiness, you know, like we're going to do some yoga in the morning and then we're going to do some remote viewing and it's all going to bring us to this sort of universal awareness kind of thing. And it, it's all very uh, theosophical in how it's, how it kind of is presented. Um, that's very vague, I know, but, um, if you go back and read the, the kind of stuff that was being written in the late 1800s, early 1900s about, um, you know, what psychic potential meant for the, the coming new age and that kind of thing. Um, you know, cause the new age idea that we have like from the eighties is like the new, new age. And then we've got like a new, new age now that's new from the new age that was in the eighties. But in the late 1800s, there was also a new age. You know, there were, there were people prophesying the, the, birth of this new age of psychically aware universal consciousness uh mm -hmm. you know kind of thing and so we keep getting this kind of repeat of that and it really you know i think again it, it talks to that longing for meaning and and that kind of thing that people kind of overlay you know the on these phenomena so so does like the theosophy does that have any did that have any influence on like you know scientology well, Scientology is weird because Scientology, <laughs> like, so Scientology has an amazing history. And if you can, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm charmed by the history if you can ignore the reality of it, you know. But um, <laughs> L. Ron Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard was a sci fi writer. And he was really, uh, he was in with Robert Heinlein and the whole kind of like LA sci fi culture. Um, that and the you know at the you know ray palmer and who uh was kind of the, the the father of flying saucers and that right like ray palmer worked with kenneth arnold to get the the first reports of that out and so l ron hubbard was in that scene but he was also hanging out with jack parsons who was uh crowley's oto rep in the hollywood area right and Jack Parsons was a rocket scientist. He, you know, did uh, work with the early, the founding of J the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab and created solid state rocket fuel. And he was one of the early, like, Manhattan Project rocket guys. Um, and so L. Ron Hubbard and Parsons were doing some ritual magic. And L. Ron Hubbard and Parsons were also both obsessed with early sci-fi and fantasy culture. And... Um, you know, some people say that L. Ron Hubbard at one point said he was going to create a religion. And basically, he created this religion, which is a mix of his sci-fi writing and uh, ritual magic, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, you know, back in the, the 30s and 40s, um, parapsychology, new thought, um, psychic training from new thought and kind of popular occultism... And then deeper levels of kind of initiatic occultism with the OTO and, and various other uh, organized bodies of training, uh, Golden Dawn, kind of in its like later days of, of sort of drifting around. That was that was all mixing together, you know, like the early Society for Psychical Research in the 1800s. Um, Henri Bergson, uh, his uh, sister was Moyna Mathers, who became the head of the Golden Dawn. Right. Like, so 
there was this intermixing of the parapsychologists with like serious occultists and um you know the theosophists were intermixing and all that too so um it's a it's a really weird kind of like soup that this all flowed out and then everybody started to specialize so when jb ryan came around with the uh laboratory parapsychology they wanted to kind of cut all that stuff out and like let's not be mingling with the occultists and that you know mm-hmm. um and then the occultists there's a there's this book by um a guy who writes under the pen name of sadir called initiations and sadir was a french uh martinist and uh, uh practicing occultist that in this book initiations there's this awesome meeting of of all of these different groups that are coming around this uh you know kind of a cult master and one of the guys is uh they're talking about how they're going to bring seance phenomena into science and so they're they're presenting this plan for how to do a seance and the occult master's standing there and he's listening very patiently and then he says you know well that's all well and good but it doesn't matter like that's not the point so you can get this phenomena to happen we can do all this stuff in fact here's how to do your experiment better but that's not the point and you know i could do it for you right now but i'm not going to and so that was kind of where the you know the occultists drift off from that the parapsychologists want straight science so they drift off from anything called a cult and um scientology l ron hubbard kind of took both and was like well let's just run with it with this weird you know self-help kind of cult group you know um and then obviously put off and uh ingo swan and pat price all had used scientology at a certain point um before getting into the remote viewing stuff and russell targ actually came out of theosophy where he was reading a lot of this theosophical stuff because um theosophy had a a ton of the theosophists were really interested in comparative religious stuff so they often were the ones that were translating old gnostic texts or they were translating um you know uh texts from india and that um i'm really jumping around here but just to give an idea of like just how how kind of strange it all is gandhi right like gandhi learned sanskrit better from theosophists so that he could read some of the gitas and then uh you know he got a lot of his concept of indian spirituality and hinduism from the theosophists who were had a publishing house in uh and still do in adyar india so you know it's this weird influence that's kind of floated around where these different groups have kind of you know pushed in and and moved moved around the stuff a lot of the early uh flying saucer stuff um influenced by mead lane who was a practicing occultist and had ties with the folks in the oto um you know so uh it gets weird if you actually like look at the the kind of historical streams that go through it you know so there on one hand you have the phenomena and you have the people who are experiencing the phenomena and on the other hand you have these overlays of kind of training practice that can get you to the phenomena and how to understand the phenomena and then the mythopoetic kind of narrative overlays that each of these groups puts on what you know what that means what the phenomena means in a, in a kind of metaphysical sense i want to take a moment here and thank all my patrons Without you, this show may not be a thing. And uh, I'm going to give a shout out to those pledging $10 or more. Super Inframan, Allison Cook, Lindsay Trebet, Tim, Big Boy Limina, Craig Parmenter, Walker, Joanna Rojas, Maddie, David Moore, Vincent Trewell, The Great Change, Stone Wilderness, Luke Osborne, Becky Trainer, Chris Barr, Rob Drummond, Alex Whitcomb, Edu Camahort. Tactical Therapist, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Sam Sharon, Jennifer Campbell, American Rambler, Kevin, John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Yorg, Matthias Sunby, Dominic O'Malley, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, J. Otto Bullet, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Ray Benedetto, Lindsay Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Matthew Sproul, Kevin Shrek, Patricia Guy Quinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris 646, Carla Mahoney, and James Lattimore. Thank you all so very, very much. All right, so that was part one 
of the show with David Metcalf and Cheryl Lee Black. I have another hour, I believe, of this show left. So if you're a Patreon, you already have the whole thing. You heard, you heard the whole show. Um, if not, I am either going to air it, uh, I'll either put it on the website and uh, YouTube and stuff during the week, or I'll save it for next week's show and maybe add some listener stories or something at the end. I'm not sure exactly yet. I'm still... As I said at the beginning, kind of recovering from the flood. And uh, I do have at least one interview planned for this week. I had another one I hope to do with a couple of authors, but I haven't had time to finish the book yet. So uh, that might be get pushed off an additional week. I apologize for uh, <laughs> having to kind of slow down a little bit. But there's a ton of stuff I have to do to make sure this doesn't happen again. Uh, weather is freaky lately. All right. I hope everyone else is staying safe out there. If you want to become a patron, patron, go to wheredtheroadgo.com. It's only $3 a month. You get extra stuff uh, as much as I can I can put together for everyone. And you get shows early, and uh, it helps out a great deal. And again, thank you to everyone who donated to help me out Uh with the flood damage and stuff. It is incredibly appreciated. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.